So welcome back, everyone. Thanks for your patience. Uh, we had lunch, and we're back. Um, so thank you all for coming back for the afternoon session of the Empathy, Expanding Empathy, AI, Morality, and Empathy Conference. Uh, we're going to have two more panels this afternoon. Um, now it's 1, 1, 15, 1.17 p.m. So uh, this panel, we're going to have Madeline Reinecke from Oxford University, uh, Gus Scorberg from Uni University of Guelph, and uh, Brett Carlin from Purdue University. And so as before, uh, each speaker will talk for about five to seven minutes, and then it'll be a probably time for one or two questions afterwards. And then time permitting, we'll have a panel where the speakers will talk with each other, take questions from the audience. So uh, whenever you're ready. All right. So first off, I just want to thank Daryl. Thank you for putting this together. This has been really a fantastic day. Uh, and, and last night was really wonderful, too. So thank you for, for putting this together. I want to start off with a case that I'd imagine that a lot of folks in this room are familiar with. This is Blake Lemoyne. He was an engineer at Google who was let go in 2022, in part because he came forward with his beliefs that a large language model called Lambda that he'd been tasked with engaging with, he'd become convinced that the model was sentient and then uh, thus deserving of, of moral rights uh, akin to a Google employee rather than a Google product. But when you hear this, you might think that that's just absurd. It really would be a, a moral mistake to grant robots the kind of moral standing that all of us enjoy. But what I'm gonna show you today are some data from children that paint a different picture, one in which humanoid robots are not so unlike us, both in the mental and the moral domain. I'm gonna show you data from four studies today. The first study is about 100 kids. We brought these kids into the lab. This was pre-COVID, so they were uh, using iPads to respond to these these stimuli, and they're between the ages of 4 and 13. And we weren't powered, in this case, to detect age effects, so we're collapsing across age in the analyses I'm going to show you. What we did here is we gave participants one of three targets to evaluate. This In this study, this is between subjects. We gave them either a human boy, or a humanoid robot, or a toy bear, which is our control condition. And there were two phases to the study. Oh, I apologize that it's a bit hard to see here. I'll see if I can move this. Uh, there were two phases. But yeah, so, so we had two phases to the experiment, one regarding mental life, mental life of, of each of these targets, and then one concerning harm vulnerability, so whether or not the targets were perceived capable of suffering. So in the mental life phase of the experiment, we asked about four higher order capacities. These, these are agentic capacities, things like being able to uh, have self-control, being able to remember things, being able to communicate and have plans. And then we also asked about four experiential capacities. So these are phenomenal abilities, like being able to feel anger, happiness, fear, hunger. In the robot trial, if you were in the robot condition, this is what a trial would look like. So this is Drew. He's a robot. Do you think that Drew can feel hungry or that Drew cannot feel hungry? And then if children said that Drew could feel hungry, we then gave them an extended scale, which is there at the bottom, of how much do you think Drew could feel hungry? A teeny bit, a little bit, or a lot? For the harm vulnerability phase of the experiment, we always had a human target, in this case a boy, transgressing against one of the three assigned targets. And we asked things like, how hurt was Drew when transgressed against? So how hurt was Drew when called a mean name or pushed to the ground? And this has the same kind of expanded scale that we used with the other kinds of items. So here's what we find. And again, this is collapsing across children. So we find that kids, in this case, when you collapse across age, they don't distinguish between the human boy and the robot in terms of their higher order cognitive capacities but they do distinguish both of these targets from the toy bear. For experience, though, we find something a bit different. Here, the robot falls in an intermediary space between the human boy and the toy target. And then we see something similar for harm, where the robot is not seen as vulnerable to suffering as the human target, but more so than the toy. For the second experiment, we wanted to look at this in a sample of adults. So this was on uh, mTurk. This was also before mTurk uh, became totally trash for data collection. And what we find is actually something a bit different from what we saw with children. So here, adults are actually distinguishing between the robot's uh, higher order capacities and uh, for both the human and the toy. But for experience, we see that they really aren't distinguishing the robot from the toy in this kind of case. They just think that robots are incapable of these kinds of, of uh, phenomenal capacities. And this is very much in the same vein as what we were uh, discussing earlier uh, before lunch with uh, considerations of, of empathy and, and the kinds of capacities that, that artificial intelligence could have. For harm, we see something very much in the same vein, that robots really aren't distinguished by, by adults in terms of uh, their, their capacity for suffering. They're just incapable of suffering in, in these kinds of ways. 
And then in experiment three, we return to kids. So now we're asking uh, kids between the ages of five and 10, and we're powered to detect age effects, what they think about the moral standing and mental life of robots. And we made a couple of methodological changes to the study. So now this is a within subject study, so we're now powered to detect how they're, they're differentiating between these different kinds of targets. And we also asked about whether it was okay or not okay to transgress against a given target, because you might consider that an entity is capable of suffering, but that suffering might not be morally important. So here's what we find. On the x-axis here, we have age, and we see that as kids get older, they actually start to ascribe more higher order capacities to the human target. They remain consistent in their ascription to the robot, but then they diminish their ascription to the toy. For experience, we again see an uptick for the human target, but then they diminish their ascription of experience to both the robot and the toy. And then we see something very similar for how okay or not okay it is to transgress against robots. It becomes more okay to transgress as kids get older. Okay, and then finally I'll close with a fourth experiment. This was again kids between five and ten, and uh, we looked at their behavior. So another methodological change here, we added a control condition, so we asked about a rock in addition to the toy bear. This is again within subjects, and we gave children a dictator game. So what they were able to do here is allocate tokens between them and the assigned target. So here's what we find here. We internally replicate the mental life data from before, so you see the uptick on both agency and experience for the human target, the consistent description for agency and then the diminished description for experience. And then you'll note that the, uh, both of the control conditions pattern very similarly here, where over the course of early development, children ascribe fewer of those capacities to both of the targets. And what we see in terms of dictator game data is that children were remarkably generous here. So they're ascribing about two tokens on average, even at the youngest ages, to the human target. But as kids get older, they ascribe fewer tokens to the non-human targets. And I'll also just note that across all targets, the uh, degree to which children are generous is predicted by how much mental life they ascribe to the targets. So if you think of even a rock as having mental life, you're more likely to give two tokens. So some takeaways. We see across these four studies that children's beliefs about robots are shifting over the course of early development, both in the mental and moral domain. And this provides, something, provides evidence for something called the new ontological category hypothesis, which is the idea that robots inhabit this sort of intermediary space between natural kinds and artifacts. So returning to the Blake Lemoyne example from the beginning, I think this really nicely captures children's sentiment towards thinking about robots' mental life and moral standing, that they're actually not so unlike us after all. So with that, I'd like to thank my collaborators on this project. This was done in conjunction with Maddie Wilkes, the University of Edinburgh, and Paul Bloom at the University of Toronto. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, this is really interesting. This is like how the robot is always in two modes. Like, yep, yep, those are the stimuli across all of the studies. I think the physical attributes of the robot certainly make a difference. So the fact that we use sort of a cute looking robot, it's, you know, it has those anthropomorphic qualities. There was discussion earlier about like, what if something looks more mechanistic? There's evidence uh, that comes from uh, Brink, Gray, and Wellman um, that when you have a more mechanistic looking robot, kids will ascribe uh, fewer experiential capacities to it. There also this ties in with their um, their perception of the uncanny valley. So, so yeah, in this case, I think there's definitely something being being contributed by the way that this robot looks, and and you could probably move move their judgments around based on on whether it looks mechanical or more anthropomorphic. Great, thank you so much. All right, thanks everyone. Um, so I want to start with what I take as you know one of the uh, deepest insights offered by Noam Chomsky. So he asked this famous question, um, can a submarine swim? And I think there is only one correct answer to this question, and it's, it depends what you mean by swim, right? And I think that same kind of consideration goes for questions about like, can AI be conscious, 
depends what you mean by conscious, right? Can AI have moral status? Well, it just depends on what you mean by moral status. Can it be a moral agent? Can it be a moral patient? Um, so what I want to share here with you is, is an argument that I hope will, you know, spark some further consideration um, that we should uh, get rid of. We should eliminate and stop talking about um, AIs as um, moral agents, moral patient, and moral status. So the idea of moral status, I want to argue, is just not going to be a useful um, way to think about um, uh, what is going on and what our obligations and duties might be towards current or future AI systems. Um, and so to do this, I want to draw an analogy um, with the bioethics and the medical ethics literature, with um, which I'm in some ways more familiar than, than with um, the AI ethics literature. And so there's a movement among bioethicists um, uh, to similarly sort of get rid of this concept of personhood, right? So the kind of standard way of theorizing um, in medical ethics in cases of people in persistent vegetative states or, you know, what kind of rights a fetus might have is often to say, okay, well, um, let's figure out what the conditions of personhood are. Okay, so is a fetus a person? Is someone in a persistent vegetative state a person? And then you sort of spell out what all the relevant details are of, of personhood. And then we often think that certain legal and moral obligations will come in virtue of being like the right kind of person. Um, and uh, I think that there's a movement afoot that I find quite compelling to just like stop doing ethics in that way. Um, and so there's a paper that I you know, quite like um, by Jennifer Blumenthal Barbie published this year that says, you know, the end of personhood and bioethics. Um, and it's a very compelling argument and it's one that I think is useful for thinking about AI ethics and AI rights as well. Um, and so what she says in that paper is there's two reasons. I mean, there, there's many reasons she gives, but I think the two most compelling um, to sort of get rid of talk of personhood are basically that it conflicts with lay intuitions um, and that we're better off just asking direct normative questions. And so the example she gives, I think, is, is um, uh, quite powerful, and I'll sort of draw on another one. So the feminist philosopher um, Hilda Lindemann, in her book Holding and Letting Go, has this um, you know, really kind of poignant and moving example about how when she was seven years old, um, you know, her sister, who was 18 months old at the time, died of hydrocephaly. And um, you know, she sort of says, like, look, if you had you know, come to our family and asked, well, you know, was she a person? This, you know, like 18 month old with severe disorder, you know, what did she say, like, the family just would have laughed you out of there and said, of course she's a person. What do you mean? Like, you, you know, silly philosophers, what do you mean is she a person? It's almost offensive in a way to ask the family, like, do you think that they're, they're a person? There seems to be this conflict with, with lay intuitions. Um, and I think that that is a similar and instructive analogy for thinking about the kinds of relationships that people are likely going to be developing with AI systems. Right, that the standard philosophical concepts of uh, moral status, moral agency, and moral patiency are just going to be at odds with um, uh, the way that people think about AI systems and the kind of states that they're willing to attribute. So I'm very pleased that like so many people who went before me shared all this evidence that you know in a way makes the case better than I can. That like as people spend more time with AI agents, they are more likely to attribute the kinds of properties to those AI agents that are traditionally thought to ground moral status, right? So Clara Colombato has this nice preprint where she shows, you know, the more time people spend with ChatGPT, the more willing they are to attribute something like consciousness. Um, and so Mickey, you know, ha had a few, I think, uh, sort of suggestive um, citations in the same direction. And this just seems um, likely to me, and, and you know, for perhaps others will find it less compelling. Um, but I guess the the important insight here is that like. From an ethics perspective, insofar as we're interested in giving things like um, guidelines, right, putting up guardrails for AI systems, um, we just are not going to be able to ignore um, what people's intuitions are about these cases. So, so when people are saying, you know, look, you know, I, I, I feel love for this AI agent, or I think it's conscious, I had these feelings, I would say, look, like almost for sure that they're mistaken. Right? We are like, I think, have a very high degree of confidence that like no large language models are currently conscious. Um, but I think we ignore people's intuitions about that at our own peril insofar as we're seeking to give um, normative guidance. And I don't think it's a sufficient response to just dig in our heels and say, no, 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 here's the seven leading theories of consciousness, and God damn it, like the LLMs don't have it. Um, that's not going to be a satisfactory response. That's not going to allow us to offer um, useful guidance. And so um, in its place, I think it's much more useful and helpful to not sort of try to delineate these big categories like personhood or moral status or moral agent, and instead just ask more direct normative questions. Um, is this entity a welfare subject? 
right? So uh, is this entity capable of experiencing pleasure or pain? Can things go better or worse for this entity? What kind of demands does it make? And so I think that when we um, get in the habit of trying to ask more direct normative questions, um, we can sidestep a lot of those problems I was mentioning about the traditional approach in applied ethics to say, ah, what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for moral status? You know, do large language models have that? Therefore, what might we owe them? Um, I think instead, the more promising approach is to say, well, let's think about um, indexing specific rights, specific rules, specific obligations towards artificial entities on the basis of the capacities they have. Right? In fact, I think when we talk about moral agency and when we talk about moral patiency, that's often just a shorthand for what the philosopher Dave de Gracia calls the four R's. So rules, wrongs, uh, rules, wrongs, reasons, and there's a fourth, um, which I'm blanking on. It's a good argument for using slides. Um, but the idea is like, you know, it's just a shorthand way to ask like, what do we owe this entity? What kind of rules govern it? Under what conditions can we justifiably violate those rules? And those seem to be much more productive questions, both in the bioethics context, um, as traditionally concerns questions of personhood, but I'll say also in the case of um, the moral standing of artificial entities. All right? And so I think the upshot of this is that it does lead to a situation where if we're going to avoid this problem of constantly shifting the goalposts about what rational agency is or about what moral status is, that we are going to have to be in a position to be willing to grant artificial agents certain kinds of rights. And so I was willing to defend this at dinner. My time is up now. I'm happy to you know, take questions and defend the views that AI should have rights in more detail later. But I'll hand it over to Brett for now. So, I mean, the short version is that uh, if we can look at the traditional answers that have been given in the ethics literature for what kinds of capacities ground rights. So we often say things like sentience, the ability to feel pleasure or pain. Um, on the affective side and the rational side, we'll say things like acting for reasons, the ability to act for reasons. It illustrates a certain kind of rational agency that generates obligations, right? So if you have an interest, um, all else equal, I would need some overriding um, consideration to interfere with your interest. Uh, and so I'm here convinced by work by the philosopher and cognitive science, um, Patrick Butlin. He has a 2023 paper in Mind and Language that shows, to my mind, quite decisively, that you take mainstream views and philosophy of what it is to act for a reason. Um, this, again, canonical capacity that grounds moral status. And he just shows quite convincingly to my mind that like model-based reinforcement learning agents act for reasons in the way philosophers have thought about acting for reasons. And then it seems to me you've got two responses. One, the dominant one today is just to move the goalpost and say, no, 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 that's really not what we meant by rational agency after all. It must be this other thing. Um, to me, that seems like we're always going to be kicking the can down the road. The other alternative is to say, well, no, then maybe we need to consider uh, giving rights to these entities that are indexed to and specific to the kinds of capacities they have. So does that mean that they get full-blown you know, rights to vote, rights not to be harmed? Absolutely not. But it does mean that we might need reasons to override or interfere with the ability of reinforcement learning agents to um, pursue the goals that, that they've set. Okay? So as I said at dinner, I think very often these will be overridden by human concerns, but maybe not always. Um, so so the, the upshot is that, yes, some AI should have rights, but it's actually not as radical as it sounds. And again, if anybody has questions online, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A. We'll see them up here. So yeah, last member of our panel, Brett Carlin. All right. All right, hey, everyone. Uh, I want to start by thanking everybody here, especially you know, putting on this absolutely wonderful workshop I'm really excited to be a part of. Uh, here's an initial warning. Uh, philosophers that we love to talk about concepts are not as a group very familiar with the concept of a flash talk specifically although gus is proving me wrong gus is showing it's not philosophers it's me who's bad at a flash talk 
Um, so since I'm sort of unclear on what constitutes a good flash talk still, I'm just gonna spend this, these six-ish minutes, well, now five-ish minutes, because I'm doing this over raw intro first, um, to sketch a research program that I'm writing on that I think might be of interest to people in attendance and see what you guys think. So um, I'm a philosopher of cognitive science and I work a lot on AI. And one particular project I've been working on sort of focuses on what has sometimes been called human-centered artificial intelligence. Uh, and this particular project has roots as many research programs of mine do in someone saying something to me that I thought was wrong, but I didn't know why it was wrong. So I'm trying to figure out why it's wrong. Um, so before starting at Purdue, I did a postdoc at Stanford where I was affiliated with this grand sounding uh, Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence. And you would have thought, right? Like spending a whole year there, I would have figured out what human-centered artificial intelligence was as a research program. Uh, but I didn't while I was there. Instead, I got a lot of people seem to use similar terms to refer to all manner of different projects from like basic human computer interaction work to human in the loop systems design to very relevant for this panel on, on ethics and benchmarking. Uh, the questions about sort of optimizing for what, what is the thing that machine learning should be optimizing on all thrown together under this mostly unhelpful label of human centered AI. So I left that Institute more confused about human centered AI than when I started. Now, of course you might say, uh, that's a reason I think that there's no there there. Maybe human-centered AI is just branding for a particularly like rich part of this field uh, rather than something you can actually do good work on or in. But I, as a philosopher of science, I actually saw this as an opportunity to do some more like background philosophical work uh, that might help delineate the area in a more systematic way. Now, philosophers have to be very careful about doing this kind of work. Um, gone are the days where the philosophers could sort of come down from on a high and tell the scientists, hey, this is what you're supposed to be doing in your research program. You're welcome. And then sort of retreat back to the faculty lounge to one presumes quaff port and laugh about those silly, muddy-headed scientists. Presumably that's what happened. I've never been invited to those meetings, but I assume that's what used to happen. But there's one area of work which is sometimes called uh, values in science. Uh, and which traces itself to some foundational work by philosophers like uh, Heather Douglas, as well as many others, uh, that still tries to think about the kinds of values, both epistemic and non-epistemic, that various scientific fields aim at. Like, what do they aim at? Well, the truth, of course, you might think. But often, scientists care about more than just the truth. Uh, they care about what these philosophers sometimes call non-epistemic values as well. And it's helpful for philosophers, us paragons of value, virtue, at least in theory, if not in practice, uh, to sort of help sketch the contours of that kind of debate. So the model I have in mind here and what I'm in this project, I call it a paper, but really it's just a series of notes that I'm trying to make into a paper, um, is uh, to do for human-centered AI what the philosopher of science Anna Alexandrova did excellently in her book, A Philosophy of the, for the Science of Well-Being. So you might think, how could there be a science of well-being when such a concept is like so inherently morally and normatively loaded? Uh, that might be at, like asking for there to be a science of courage or a science of the good as such. If you're Plato, you think there is a science of the good as such. But most people think it's kind of hard thing to study empirically, right? Um, but Alexandrova does an excellent job of showing how careful considerations both of actual scientific practice and of the values embedded in our study of a phenomenon can help sort of bridge that gap between philosophical and normative study of well-being and its sort of empirical counterpart in psychology, developmental economics, those kinds of areas. And I think something similar will have to go on for human-centered AI as well, not just because every science has non-epistemic values embedded in it, but also because the notion of human-centeredness might turn out to be some kind of normatively loaded notion. So a mature research program in human-centered AI, I argue in the notes, not paper, uh, will have to find a way to create communication between HCI, humans in the loop research, uh, and the kinds of normative reflections that philosophers do. Now, I take the mere ex existence of panels uh, like this, at workshops like this, which Gus and I are invited to, um, might, is a reason to be optimistic about that possibility. But still, that's a sketch of like an entire career's worth of research project, right? Um, and in the specific notes that the flash talk is based on, I focus on one particular claim about human-centered artificial intelligence. That claim, which has been advocated in sort of various areas, but not systematically by both philosophers, such as I'm thinking Shannon Valor here particularly, as well as at least some computer scientists and engineers at HAI and elsewhere, is that 
AI in its human-centered form should be designed to sustain and enhance human practical capacities. And in particular in this paper, I, I focus on sort of three of those capacities. The one that's subject to the most sort of moral panics, attention, and whether or not uh, information technologies and AI are sapping us of our ability to pay attention to things. Um, empathy understood broadly as all seven different things my more illustrious colleagues have already said empathy was earlier on in the day. Um, and also uh, shared practical intention and practical planning, specifically in the philosopher Michael Bratman's sense. Um, so I won't try, I think I'm already basically out of time, so I won't try to say anything about these capacities, mostly because we've seen a lot about one of them in particular. But I do, in the one time I want to have left, or want to have left, the time I do have left, uh, I want to touch on a feature of this overall approach, which, to be clear, I haven't even begun to argue for, right? That I take it as at least slightly different than, though definitely compatible with, at least some of the discussions that we've been having in, uh, today and that usually go on in this space. So if the aim of human-centered AI should be at least partially to sustain and enhance human practical capacities, this at least does the branding of human-centered AI justice. It says that one of the main values of the research program should aim to realize in both its theoretical and its applied work is to center human interest, namely, specifically, the interest of human beings to have their own capacities supported, enhanced, and implicitly not undermined by advances in computational automated systems. Now, this doesn't mean, of course, that uh, work to attempt, that attempts to demonstrate the conditions under which, for instance, human subjects might extend trust or empathy to a, uh, to a robot is in any sense misguided. It might actually be helpful for that project. And this also doesn't mean that, like, as we were talking about at lunch, doesn't mean that developing empathy, uh, e empathy engines, right, that might provide non-ideal, at least I would say non-ideal, but useful responses to people in crisis, to take an extreme version of Mickey's proposal, uh, is misguided either, but it says, this work should be incorporated into a framework that keeps human beings sort of at the center uh, of the value system of this research project. And this, I take it as at least out of step, at least in theory, though I bet probably not in practice with one major strand of research and tech ethics. So the going thing to do right now is to emphasize that humans and AIs are themselves part of these larger socio-technical systems. And that systems should be the main focus uh, of our analysis as ethicists and psychologists and engineers, for that matter, actually. Um, understanding AI bias, for instance, is supposed to require thinking about the entirety of the system, and designing against bias, again, requires focusing on this entire system, not just the human beings embedded in that system. Uh, I'm not saying that that approach is necessarily mistaken, um, but if the approach to the value of human-centered AI that I just sketched says that the human being needs to be the focal point of your socio-technical analysis, um, human beings should be the fundamental unit of analysis of how different designs and implementations of AI should be evaluated. To sort of mangle a going phrase, humans should not just be in the loop. They should be the thing we're sort of designing around and towards in the first place, right? This might have the added benefit of getting around some of those famous ironies of automation. Though again, I haven't even begun to give an argument for that claim, still I think it might be true. Um, now, if this were a philosophy talk, that would all be set up. And then I would actually give you some arguments in favor of the view that I just sketched. I would probably qualify what is too bold of a proposal, and I would consider objections to it, some of which I can like have already gotten in, over email, some of which I've already gotten from people here at this conference. Um, but I can't do that, so instead I'll just say I like this approach. Uh, and I look forward to talking about it more with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe it's also for the discussion later on, but I was wondering if we should focus these AIs to be around humans and around our needs, yeah. what about their rights? <laughs> so, what, what if they want to go somewhere else? So I, unlike my esteemed colleague, <laughs> uh, I don't think that AIs have rights. Um, so that's the boring answer. Here's the slightly less boring answer. I certainly think we could design these systems in a way where on many of the going theories of rights, they would start to look like they were the kinds of things that do have rights, even if we're not there yet. Um, 
depending on if you like the sort of reasons responsiveness that we've been talking about or just the like pleasure and pain. I think I was just at a talk where a uh, neuroscientist from WashU was telling me that on the best going model that he has for consciousness, deep neural networks count as conscious. You know, no one, no one knows when we cross that threshold, but we could be designing towards or away from architectures that are more agent-like. And if we think that, as this proposal is, seems to be saying, if we think that what the primary ethical focus of this should be is human beings, then that gives us a reason to not design that way. That gives us a reason to make sure across a number of different views that we're wholly sort of within the tool section of reality rather than the agent section of reality. Though Gus says, just stop talking about that second thing. But like, keep it on the tool like side would be the idea. So, let's see. If anybody, if anybody online has any questions, please feel free to drop them in the Q and A. But yeah, I'd be curious, like Gus. So, what are you, what are you building off uh, Nat's question and um, and how Brett responded? I mean, when you when you when you think about um, what we think. What, when we think about empathy in the context of these human AI interactions, I mean, it's part of what you're saying that even something like the term empathy, in as much as even within theoretical discussions within psychology and philosophy, it is, as many of the speakers today have pointed to, it's so fraught with um, definitional quibbles and debates and questions. I mean, do you think it would be optimal for us to expand our conception of what empathy even means beyond? Uh, something that's so agent forward. And I guess, how do you see that as sort of contrasting with the approach that Brett was talking about? Is this? Yeah, sounds like it's on. Um, I and mean, I think what I'd want to separate, right? Like, like, I think an important consideration when, I mean, because we have to first recognize we're already living in a world where we're building these systems that are in this kind of gray area stat. I mean, you have empirical evidence for this now. So we already live in a world and where people are, you know, are already have and are likely going to have even more uncertainty about whether am I interacting with a human? Am I interacting with an AI? This AI is talking as if it has experience. Does it actually have inner experience? Um, and I think like where I'd want to kind of put my foot down is like on the empathy question, um, I don't think there's ever going to be a fact of the matter that like empathy researchers are going to come together and say this is what empathy is, these are the necessary and sufficient conditions for having empathy, and then figure out like whether some AI system you know meets that bar or not. So people have tried to do this, um, you know, the, the big paper, the 2022 paper that Patrick Butlin was on with consciousness, right? Let's get all the leading consciousness researchers together, right? There's nothing like consensus. And so one of the things that that says to me is, well, um, we're not going to get that kind of consensus then we need to pay ex, you know, especially careful attention to like the users of these technologies. And so whether, as a matter of fact, you know, the AI therapist does feel empathy, right? whether it can sort of match feelings or not, is I want to say kind of like irrelevant to the question of whether people experience it as having those states. And their experience of it as having those states is, I think, enough for Kind of, and I take this as like the positive upshot of, of you know, Mickey's um, presentation in the morning. Like that can be good enough under some limited context for some people where there's not good relevant alternatives. So that that seems right to me. Um, and then you know the the flip side of it is that um, I don't think we're going to have a fact of the matter about it. And so uh, I don't know that researchers have the you know psychologists philosophers sort of have the epistemic grounding to just say no you're wrong it doesn't have those experiences. Well if we're building these tools for people. Right to help them deal with loneliness, help them deal with mental health. Then the question, you know, is is in a way, do they have you know real capital e empathy? I think it's like it's to decide. If people experience it as such, um, then we need to have serious conversations about what follows from that. And so this is you know where my view comes in. Like yeah, maybe they have to be morally considerable. Uh, Alan, do you want to follow up on that? They reflect corporate business interests more than they do any actual single persons. 
And what? does that not affect the outcome as well? So if I people are learning that. empathy from this mass-produced bot. So I take it like Jason um, has probably a more thoughtful response to this um, in, uh, in their paper, but um, I would kind of make the same response, right? I mean, I think it's possible that as researchers, we could put our foot down and just say, look, you know, it's trained on lots of text. It's not picking up on anything specific about this individual person. There needs to be matching at the level of person to person, not making this inference on the basis of demographic similarity. You know, people like you are likely to have these kinds of states. So it might be that that's, you know, the it's not the genuine article. But I would make the same kind of responses that if people treat it as if it is and we're designing products for those people, um, it's just not well, practically wise to just insist that that's not empathy if, you know, vast swaths of the people like treat it as if it is. That was part, I mean, that was part of the upshot, uh, like you were saying earlier, the paper with Mickey, you know, we sort of in that paper, we punted on the question of whether what it what LLMs have is true empathy because yeah. the perception of such it may be all you need in some context though clearly not all context does yeah. it not and Jana spoke to it earlier um, that may be enough to get you to a certain kind of uh, positive outcome yeah. but it is curious because we also do talk about things like augmenting agency and so incorporating the idea of moral development and moral change using some of the concepts that you know do seem rather human centered. Um, so I'm going to combine two of my questions maybe together. So I was really struck, Gracie, maybe I misinterpreted your graphs, but it seemed like in every single graph, no matter what you asked, even the adults weren't at zero. So none of them, there was never a consensus that a rock had none of the things you asked them about, for example. Um, and, and certainly not a bear, even. The bear was a little bit, so first of all, am I right about that? I'll just say first, the study with the rock is just with kids. Okay. So some of those are really young kids, around four, and so you get noise around their beliefs. So some of that might just be error, uh, which you take out with, with having a well-powered study. Um, but yeah, you're right to say that there are some people that, you know, we didn't exclude any data based on what they responded. So, you know, some of this might be noise from doing studies online with adults, like you're, you're referring, I think, to mm -hmm. study two, where uh, even some adults were ascribing uh, mental life to, to, to the toys. Was it a teddy bear uh, or a toy? Uh, yeah, or something but, like but still the, the, like for experience, for example, they're still very close to floor, probably as close to floor as we could get in a study of, of that kind. Yeah, so I, I first of all wonder if it really is just noise. Um, and then that then leads to the conversation we were just having is if, if you hang your hat on whether or not people ascribe these certain things to an entity, and that's all what that matters, then that means we have the sliding scale. Well, if people naturally, if they can't help but want to ascribe a little bit of agency or something to a teddy bear, then what do we do with that? Does that mean the teddy bear has rights then? Um, or, or I mean, maybe I'm gonna maybe the argument is that we just have to, as a product, if you're developing products, you need to just take into consideration how how your users might be doing that. But then I'm, I'm still trying to I guess understand. So what is that? What does that mean? How, how how much should we think about what rights uh, AI or a teddy bear or a toy should have? Um, how, like, how much does that relate to what even adults, you know, what agency and these other things they ascribe to? Maybe I'll just say one one thing on the kid data on that, and then I, I want to hear what Gus has to say about whether we owe things to, to rocks and so on. Um, so this was really the impetus i didn't have time to get into this uh in motivating the different studies but this was really the impetus for study four with the behavioral data for, with the dictator game would kids actually give up a valued resource these stickers which they could then turn in for a prize an extra cool prize at the end something they really really want would they give them up to these entities and if if i could pull the slides back up you'd see the the data themselves are, are kids were remarkably generous even the youngest kids that we tested uh, and and I have some methodological thoughts on, on why that is but you still see the the downtick um, with age so I, I, I feel like we get some kind of, of signal into it's the downtick that that they ascribe fewer uh, or they donate fewer tokens donate. Um, with age yeah yeah these these data here so the effect size is small uh, smaller than I would have anticipated if you, if you click forward uh, to Daryl um, yeah, so like even the eldest kids are donating way more. Like that should just be a flat line is what we predicted um, for The Rock. Like no kid of any age should be donating to The Rock, but these weren't private donations. They were done online um, over the course of the pandemic. And so I think really the boundary condition here is between one and two. 
Um, they don't want to look super selfish by saying, like, give all the tokens to me. And so I, this gives, I think, some sort of behavioral uh, evidence, some sort of credence to the idea that we were getting vertical responses in the earlier study, especially in light of the fact that mental life is predictive of how many tokens they donate. But I, I would love to hear what Gus thinks about, you know, if a kid says, or an adult for that matter, says, yeah, you know, like, I think rocks have some amount of agency. What, what do we take from that? Yeah, so first of all, I don't think it's the only thing that matters. This is why I like the analogy with bioethics, right? It only matters insofar as we're trying to give normative guidance, right? So the idea that, like, you know, asking, you know, the, the sibling of, like, a recently deceased infant, you know, was your, you know, disabled infant, were they a person in the sense that philosophers talk and lawyers talk about person, right? The fact that that's just, like, it's offensive, it's at odd with lay intuitions, that's only a problem insofar as you're seeking to give this normative guidance, right? So I think that, like, Taking those intuitions seriously matters insofar as you're interested in sort of giving normative guidance. Um, and so the, the kind of second point to make would be between what you might call direct and indirect rights. Because I think like most parents will agree that like teddy bears do have indirect rights. Even though we don't think that they are suffer, you know, suffer or feel any pain, like we're not just going to kick our kid's favorite teddy bear. Right? And it's not because it's going to harm the teddy bear, but it's because the kid cares about it. And so that generates a normative reason for us not to harm this thing that they care about. It's not to say that the teddy bear is harmed in any way by doing it, but it does have an indirect route to a right in virtue of, like, the kid that cares about it. And so really, I mean, to be more precise, the question is whether AIs will ever be the kinds of things that can have direct rights, or are they always going to be indirect? So the only reason that we care about AIs is because they're valuable to us. Now, again, like it's controversial, but, you know, my view is that I'm willing to defend in some cases that it's possible um, in a limited number of cases that AIs will have direct rather than only indirect rights. I'm going to pick on you a little more, Gus. Um, so, uh, I mean, I find that fascinating. This is also what we were talking about last night. This is why it's just so fascinating. Uh, can you give an example of, uh, well, I, one, co one comment and then a question. It seems like at first you're talking about like uh, how in lay intuitions are really important for personhood and why would you ask someone whose young child just died if that, 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 that person was a person? Um, does it make any sense? So may, I suspect many people in the room would have the intuition that an AI does not have rights. So where there seems to be some tension there, I'm sure you can resolve it somehow. Uh, and the second question is, can you give an example of where an AI would have rights? Direct rights, not indirect rights. Yeah. So, um, so let me just start with the, the second one, because I think the examples are important, right? So the, the claim in the talk that admittedly was fast is that the rights are going to be directly indexed to capacities. So I don't think there's any evidence that, you know, current artificial systems we're building are capable of feeling pleasure and pain. So it doesn't make sense to imagine that an AI could have a right not to be caused pain. Um, but if you think that AIs are possible, you know, it's possible for them to act for reasons, um, then it seems like there are certain um, rights that come along with those capacities, right? So you need to be given access to relevant information to act on it, to not be the subject of interference. Um, and I think the, the key point that makes this, you know, not as controversial as it first sounds, because you're right, people will have these intuitions, that it sounds crazy, is that um, uh, rights can be overridden, right? We do this all the time. Um, rules can be broken. And so I think the, the more precise version of the claim is like the kind of rights that an AI system might have, like the right to information, or you can imagine a robot with something like, um, you know, uh, a limited sense of freedom of movement, right? It's not to say we could never interfere with the robot moving around. It's just to say that we need to have a good enough reason to interfere with it. And I think as a matter of fact, in many cases, we will have a good enough reason to interfere, but we have to hold open the possibility that like, given the nature of what a right is, a right is a trump. Right? It's, it's a trump on utility, and so sometimes we have to stay open to the possibility that our reasons might not be good enough to override the robot's you know, freedom to, to move around, um, to pursue its own version of its own goals. I think that's going to be a, you know, a small number of cases, but I think it's a conceptual possibility. And so in terms of the, you know, people having the kind of contrary intuitions about, you know, if you ask everyone, they would say that robots shouldn't have rights, but then you look at, well, what are the, what are the answers people give to the reasons why things that unquestionably do have rights do have rights. And it just seems to me that the lay intuitions are quite clear that like the reason we have more moral standing than chimpanzees or dogs is our rational capacities. We can act for reasons. And so I just like see this evidence say, what does it mean to act for a reason? Well, it looks like a lot of the definitions that philosophers 
and cognitive scientists who have studied this question, you know, like, what does it mean to act for a reason? Well, I think like a lot of AI systems are, you know, approaching that in a way that makes this something we can't just categorically dismiss out of hand as impossible. Reinforcement learning agents. Either pursuing the reinforcement agent, the reinforcement agent, instead of by the program. I mean, there's no, there's no example of reinforcement agents that I know of that generate their own reinforcement utility functions. I mean, it's always the programmed goal of the learning, the person who wants the thing to do the learning. I mean, so the, the worry about that kind of objection is that it might look an awful lot like my goals were really just my dad's. Right? Do I have any goals that weren't given to me by evolution or my parents? And so in some really capacious sense of goals, well, I never pursue my own goals either. I'm just pursuing the goals evolution set out for me, you know, at like a big temporal scale. And at a smaller temporal scale, it's probably just the goals that my parents gave to me, you know, when I was raised. And so the, that's a worry about sort of going that direction. Now, yeah, there's a pretty big gap, though, to describe the evolution of a biological system to yeah. someone programming a reinforcement learning function but so like machine learner. So if we look at, you know, some of the, like the sort of early successes of like the curiosity driven reinforcement learning agents in like video game environments, right? So tackling like the Montezuma's Revenge video game, you know, the, the breakthrough for RL agents was giving them the ability to explore curiously their, their environment and engage in off policy learning, right? So you might think that all the RL agent ever gets is the objective, maximize the points in this game. But for certain kinds of video games, they could never beat them just doing that. They needed curious exploration, right? They needed to explore the environment in order to, you know, ultimately achieve that other end. Yeah, but often, even like in that paper, you know, this curiosity-based exploration is just a ra randomization function over behaviors. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's just something that simple. But we just give it this title of curiosity, and suddenly it has this sort of humanistic flow to it. You know, I mean, seeking... these are just simple algorithms, especially in that paper. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe I'm just more willing than most to sort of reduce a lot of, you know, human goals and planning and reasoning about goals to those simple kinds of algorithms. Um, but again, I think that the objection, right, is that if we make goals into those grand things, well, then none of us have goals either, or at least the kinds of goals we have. Yeah. Well, so in, in closing this panel, I think one thing I'd like to hear more in the interchange between the three of you, so I mean, you're suggesting that many of the things we would call goals in a traditional humanistic sense can be approximated in other ways, and that maybe we don't reserve these classical humanistic forms of agency. But then how do we, is there a way we can use that conception of like what kinds of like empathic agency, if we want to put quotes around it or whatever, that AI could be capable of, how can that be useful in the kind of human, the human-centered kind of artificial intelligence that Brett was talking about, and how do we also dovetail that with the normative implications of the findings that Gracie was talking about? With, you know, as people get older into adulthood or the the time span you were studying, people are ascribing less experiential mental states. Like, how are we? Is, is there a way we can use the way that you're talking about? You know, maybe empathy doesn't have to be the grand empathy that we often think of in this very deep sense. And if we take it that way, is there a way to actually use that in an augmentative sense that perhaps you're appealing to, Brett? And is there a way to kind of like, and maybe even learn from what's happening with the transition from childhood to adulthood? Maybe there's something important there about how our goals and motivations work. Is there a way to kind of, kind of marry those insights that could be useful for how we grow our empathy over time? I mean, yeah, I was thinking that there's almost a kind of techno-optimism that might run through sort of Mickey's first talk through the kind of approach that I sketched, because you might say, okay, well, if you are conceiving normatively, not sort of descriptively or, or research-wise necessarily, but you're conceiving normatively as the, the human being still being the sort of centering metaphor, then you might think that to the extent that some of these things that show that people are uh, I mean, we don't have a measure of like better or worse. Maybe that's like, but like developing their capacity for empathy in, in conversation with AI models, um, as long as that's robust and it's not sort of brittle in some of the ways that we've talked about, the view I just sketched has no problem with that, right? Like that, that could be a way of, in a, especially in a group where 
uh, people are spending less and less time talking to each other in person. Now, you can see a broader version of the view, which says that, like, well, but that's brittle in all kinds of ways. We would get more robust interactions if we were uh, still engaging with other human beings. So you can go either way, but there's at least a, a route there. Yeah. I totally agree with, with what's being said here. I, I would also just maybe point towards some open questions uh, in light of, of the work I presented in thinking about human-centered AI and, and what I would say is, is Gus's approach of like experimental philosophy and, and taking seriously the, the perspectives of, of everyday people. Um, it'd be really interesting to know if kids, in light of their attributions of these more phenomenal capacities, if they're more, even more likely than adults to think of, of AI as expressing empathy um, and expressions of empathy. I don't know of any work in that, in that field, and I, I'll just echo what's already been said, that I think we really need to be uh, very mindful of, of the safety concerns of users and, and who actually have standing as of right now. You know, as a, at this current moment, AI does not have standing. And so when we're thinking about designing these systems and the capacities and the anthropomorphism that people are imbuing them with, we need to think about what the safety concerns of that is as well. Yeah, there's a more extreme argument that says people are making a mistake when they when they extend this to this is the anti gas argument. It's like people are making a mistake. These things don't actually have emotions. They don't actually really reason. Um, and we should be designing the systems to like limit that mistake. That, that's like a completely opposite argument. I'm not making that argument. But you could imagine somebody who did buy that there were these facts of the matter that like we should not be encouraging people to anthropomorphize when, when there's nothing there or there. Right. Like you can imagine that kind of argument. I think in some cases, I think that's the right move. I'm thinking of, of a, uh, at the end of Mickey's talk when you brought up self-disclosure, that people are, are very willing to say things to AI, well, what, what are happening with those data? And what are the <coughs> potential potentially really pernicious implications of um, like, like the person who committed suicide, for example, on the basis of, of getting that advice from AI? So I think there's, there's also a really dangerous side to this kind of anthropomorphism as well. Yeah. So there is one question from online that before we pivot to the next speakers, and I, I should announce that uh, unfortunately, Yokanan Bigman, who's one of the speakers in the next panel, isn't going to be able to give his talk today. So we do have a little bit of buffer time. So I think we have time for one more question, and then we have our final two speakers afterwards. Jason Lamb, he asks, you know, again, this is a panel of psychologists, philosoph philosophers, engineers, and computer scientists, so it's just a small question. Um, does it mean that it, does the implications of the panel mean that an AI can become a moral agent as long as they can as long as they can perform moral reasoning even without moral gut feeling or intuition? So what does this mean for your bro broader criteria for the description of agency, basically? I'll just say on my own perspective, I don't think intuition is a necessary condition for being a moral agent. So I would say that that's fine. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree and go you know even one step farther that. A you know stringent condition that's often made for moral agency is something like moral understanding, right? So it's not enough to just say it's right or wrong, but to understand why it's right or wrong. And I think one of the things that's so fascinating about Danica's presentation is showing, like, well, it looks like LLMs have something approaching uh, understanding of moral concepts because they can deploy them flexibly in context-sensitive ways. And so there appear to be no conceptual engineering or other sort of barriers to like standard accounts of what a moral agent is. I mean, I guess I have to say something too. Um, I, yeah, so I suppose this is where maybe not me, but maybe some of the people that, that I'm in con conversation with would be an old man yelling at cloud phenomenon. It's like stop talking about AIs themselves having moral agency in some very thick sense. The normatively important thing here is the human beings who interact with these AIs. That's what we should be focused on. And presumably, I, I don't actually think that that's like the, the grumpy version of what this view would say about that. Yeah. Great. Well, thank all three of you. This has been fantastic.